Giants Among Micromorphs is a paper that we recently published in Palaios. The collaborators include scientists from several universities, members of the Dry Dredgers Fossil Club of Cincinnati, Ohio, and one undergraduate student. In this research, we considered the occurrence of tiny snails in Ordovician rocks around Cincinnati, Ohio. Larger snails, such as Cyclonema, are abundant and obvious as fossils. But in some layers, much smaller snails, often referred to as Cyclora, are extremely abundant, yet overlooked. This lovely painting depicting the two snails having a showdown at the Constellaria Bryozoan Corral is courtesy of dry dredger Kyle Hartshorn. The tiny snails are steinkerns, or internal molds, internal body cavities filled with phosphatic mineral material after the animal died. The snails are associated with other small phosphatic steinkerns. The samples we collected in this study are all from the upper Ordovician around Cincinnati, rocks deposited in a warm, shallow, subtropical sea approximately 450 million years ago, a time when North America looked a lot different than it does today. The area is much closer to and south of the equator. As in areas like the Bahamas today, the animals in the shallow seas regularly experience disturbance from hurricanes. The cyclora snails are incredibly tiny, but can be seen with a hand lens. As in this photo of an outcrop, other orangey phosphatic filled fossils can be seen as well. A hand lens is definitely necessary. Note the scale bar is half a millimeter. The other small phosphatic stein currents include tiny clams, as seen here, along with the fillings of the tips of trilobite hollow head spines. Some of the fossils, like the ridge example in the lower right, are not easy to identify at all. People have been collecting fossils for a really long time in the Cincinnati area. Back in the mid-1800s, a fossil collector gave famous paleontologist James Hall a vial of the tiny snails, and he named them Cyclora as a new type of what he thought to be a tiny but adult snail. After James Hall named Cyclora in the Cincinnati area, it was documented in the literature several times again, but few workers speculate on what they were or really what they told us about the ocean at the time. However, Ordovician rocks of the same approximate age in Iowa also yield very similar fossils. The tiny size of these fossils has been interpreted as an indication that something unusual was happening in the ocean at the time. The hypothesis is that a lack of oxygen would stunt the animals and keep them really small. Pedomorphosis is a scientific term for when adults retain aspects of their juvenile stages. So this is our first hypothesis, that the small fossils represent dwarfed individuals that were stressed by unusual oceanographic conditions. If this hypothesis is true, then they should be fully adult small versions of species found as larger specimens elsewhere. Furthermore, if the faunas were small because of stress, no normal sized fossils should be found in this deposit. An alternative hypothesis is that these were normal sized animals that were preserved in a way that favors small phosphatic internal molds of small animals or perhaps small parts of larger animals. Phosphatic fossils don't dissolve in acid. So we dissolved many limestone samples to liberate the fossils. The cyclora have a range of shapes, from tight to loosely coiled. Some have a bulbous tip and others have a more tapered tip. Over the years, these variations were used to define many species of cyclora. We have a different explanation for the varying shapes. The modern northern moon snail progressively thickens and lines its older coils as it grows. It has to, otherwise the tip of the shell would be so thin and fragile that it would be easily broken. Eventually, the oldest corals get completely filled in. If we were to make a mold of the lower, older specimen, we could not fill its last corals because they are already filled with shell material. Ordovician snails do the same thing. This is a cross-section of a larger fossil snail shell from the Ordovician. You can see a bright white circular feature, which is a mineral material filling in the cavity of the shell. As you examine the smaller corals at the top, you can see that the filling is quite small, and the shell material is thick and very layered. This animation shows the same nine internal molds in succession, from least mature with the early corals originally empty and now filled with phosphate, to the most mature with the early corals originally filled with shell material and therefore not filled with phosphate at all after the animal died. The animation then loops back to a less mature stage. This cartoon animation shows how the series of Steinkern shapes relates to the formation of layers of shell material as the snail grows. The bigger the snail gets, the less space there is inside of it for um, phosphate to fill the earliest coils. But guess what? Snails have another kind of stein current as well. Some snails coil in a way that the coils don't completely touch each other in the middle of the shell. This leaves an opening that is called the umbilicus. 
So in some cases, the snail shell itself filled with phosphatic mineral material, and the umbilicus did as well. When the shell dissolved away, the result is a mold inside another mold. In the blow-up shown here, you can see that the umbilical mold even has impressions of the ornament on the outside of the shell. In many cases, the umbilical mold separates from the mold of the shell interior. The size of the umbilical mold can then be used to guesstimate the size of the coral with which it was associated. The umbilical fills on the left correspond to typically small phosphatic living chamber steinkerns. The fills on the right represent snails at least 10 times larger. This one represents a snail that was much larger than any of the cyclora. So clearly, normal-sized snails were present. They just weren't getting preserved as whole body molds. The residues also yielded this very strange little millimeter-sized fossil. These little specimens have arched ridges on either side. One side is smooth and clearly molded against a smooth shell, while the other side is always raggedy. Co-author and dry judger Bill Heimbrock has long been fascinated by these little fossils. He was able to figure out that these were fillings of the teeth along the hinge of the common Ordovician clam Lyrodesma. This clam had a series of ridges and grooves that locked its shells together as it opened and closed. After the clam died, the grooves filled in with phosphatic shell material and eventually became loosened as the original shell was destroyed. We have evidence for clams in this environment, but the steinkerns of the whole clam shells that we find are much smaller than our lyrodesma that obviously yielded these tooth molds. Most of the whole steinkerns are a millimeter or less in size. So even though we don't find full-size lyrodesma clamshells in these phosphate-rich fossil layers, clearly lyrodesma did live in this environment. There was nothing dwarf about this clam. As it turned out, phosphatic molds preserving small parts of larger animals was a common theme. The residues yielded many phosphatic-filled fragments of rhizoans. Even though individual rhizoans are by nature very tiny, there's nothing abnormal about their size. We also found a lot of plates of crinoids. The plates themselves are quite small, yet no smaller than these same plates would be in a normal sized crinoid. Crinoid columnals like the Cincinnati crinus columnal are just small pieces of larger animals that we can see in this reconstruction by Warren and Strimpel from 1977. This columnal looks like it has been replaced by phosphate, but in reality crinoid plates are very porous, rather like a basket weave. The phosphate filled in the pores and then the original skeletal material dissolved away. The filling left behind is a mold, not really different from the other phosphatic molds that we found in this fossil assemblage. This occurrence of small fossils is not at all what it seems. Phosphate tends to fill small spaces. The spaces could be small skeletons or small areas in larger ones. Shells eventually tend to dissolve away or break down and disappear. The phosphatic filling is much more durable. So, with repeated episodes, the shells and skeletons got stirred up and broken and eventually disappeared while the tiny phosphatic stein currents came loose and got concentrated. This could have happened as hurricanes affected the sediments over and over again. The animals themselves are not unique. They were normal Ordovician marine animals. We should not use the presence of these fossils as an indicator of unusual conditions in the ancient ocean. Finally, the discovery and documentation of abundant small phosphatic stein currents in the Ordovician demonstrates that the famous small shelly fossils of the much earlier Ediacaran and Cambrian, which were also often phosphatic steinkerns, are not unique. Some scientists have interpreted the Ediacaran to Cambrian period as a taphonomic window, a period when this style of preservation was possible, that eventually snapped shut. We would suggest that this style of preservation is likely more normal and much more ubiquitous than paleontologists have realized. Thanks for listening to our presentation. If you would like more information, be sure to email one of us, either lead author Ben Dottillo or myself, Rebecca Freeman.